that's going to be really good. I was out until about 6 a.m. rehearsing this in front of a live audience at a club <laughs> around the corner. <laughs> it's been polished to perfection. Right, let's go. Uh, oh dear. Good. So I'm going to cover three things uh, in, this, in this talk. Uh, start with the policy intent. It's, an ama it's amazing to me how confused the... Uh, how did, oh, come on. Yeah. Okay, so if you listen to the sort of narrative coming from Tobacco Control, w, uh, WHO, um, Julian showed some of it e e uh, earlier, you can see all kinds of different objectives implied or explicitly stated, and these are some of them. Okay, so uh, the question is, what is, do you, you know, the easy lazy answer to this is to say, yeah, all of the above, we don't really like any of these things, so all of them. That is not actually a sensible or uh, good uh, approach. Uh, and the reason is that there'll often be trade-offs between them. And as soon as you consider trade-offs, any trade-offs between, say, reduced tobacco use and reduced disease, you can only conclude one thing, and that is that the, um, the dominant overall primary objective has to be about reducing disease. Okay? Because if you give primacy to any of the others, uh, it means that you're going to tolerate more disease in return for you know, reduced uptake by teenagers or bearing down on the tobacco industry. So logically, you're stuck with uh, disease. Now, it sounds like a trivial point, but it's incredibly important when you think about what the regulatory agenda uh, needs to look like. You have to have a singular objective to help you resolve trade-offs. Um, the other thing is you can't just do anything. You know, society sets limits on what governments can do. It doesn't allow them to, you know, just intervene willy-nilly in people's lives. It doesn't allow them to uh, seize their property and so on. So this is the classic harm uh, principle, um, that governments really shouldn't get too involved in people's lives unless there's some uh, avoidable harm caused by one person to another. Okay, so keeping... This is really not working. Okay, so maybe another type of policy objective is, isn't to focus on an outcome, but just to focus on the way things are done, the way uh, decisions are made. And maybe what you should really be doing is maximizing informed choice. Now, I happen to think, and we'll come back to this in the discussion, hopefully, that is necessary but not sufficient. Because, you know, it's quite hard for somebody to have full information about something as complex as a, a tobacco product. But that, I think, should be given, um, you know, quite a, a high sort of role in the proceedings. Now, on to the sort of, I guess, the guts of this presentation um, is... To me, the, the really important thing here is to recognize that the products can do harm, the use of products can do harm, but also policy interventions themselves can do harm. Okay? And uh, one of the things I would press all regulators to do is to be rigorous about unintended consequences of policy interventions. And... Um, the reason is, obviously, the, re the, scope, the reason there's lots of scope... Um, for unintended consequences is that the new products, uh, well, all the harm reduction products, are entering a market in which there's a dominant incumbent, very harmful product, cigarette smoking. So if you mess around with the appeal or the uh, ability of those products to displace smoking, if you compromise that in some way, the result can easily be more smoking. And this is, this is a pervasive problem with regulating these products, and it's one that has not been properly absorbed into the policy-making process, in my opinion. Um, so, yeah, it's all about somebody making a decision, in a sense. Do they, do they smoke or do they vape? And the regulatory environment, information and communications around these products affects that choice. And you end up with this sort of... Uh, I really do wish this worked. <laughs> Uh, you end up with what I think is a, a sort of like a kind of double negative in, in effect. You think you're going to be tough on e-cigarettes, you're going to bear down on snooze. The danger is you end up being easy on harm. Tough on harm reduction, easy on harm. It's a kind of logical thing about it. So I want to just... Uh, yeah, I want to really draw attention to this, which I think is the most important paragraph. The, the earlier paragraph I showed, the one where they say... Uh, you know, e-cigarettes are unlikely to exceed 5% of the risk of smoking um, and likely to be substantially less. That's the most quoted paragraph. This one coming up is the most important paragraph. <sighs> yeah. Um, 
Okay, and it's, slightly, it's a slightly con uh, convoluted statement, but it's basically an acknowledgement from RCP, the Royal College of Physicians, that you can take these approaches to regulation, you can be risk averse uh, and precautionary, hate that word in this context, but you can be risk averse and precautionary, but if the effect on the product is to make them less acceptable, less pal palatable, um, more expensive, less consumer friendly, or less pharmacologically effective, then it can cause harm by perpetuating smoking. Okay? That is the thing that regulators really need to get their head around because the, the harms that can be caused by getting that judgment wrong are probably significant, I think are significantly greater than the harms that can be caused by the products themselves. And um, we've already seen some evidence of this. This is, everyone goes, oh yes, obviously you should ban, um, you should ban uh, e-cigarette sales to under 18s. Not so, not so quick, not so fast. You probably need to do it for political reasons, but don't assume there's a public health benefit. And we already have two studies now that show that smoking has declined at a slower rate in those states where they uh, banned uh, e-cigarette sales to under 18s early. Unintended consequence of a well-meaning policy. Now we have finally have the Department of Health, a moment of candor from them after years of misleading everybody. Uh, we now have uh, them. Oh. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> right, we now have them acknowledging, th in this case, three categories of unintended consequence. The restrictions on advertising might reduce the number of consumers switching. Price increases cause people to switch back to smoking and they may, get the, they may get a black market that has uh, you know, harmful properties in its own right. Now, that's where we should be getting to with regulators. That's the thinking they should have. And they should just be careful, which they are not. They acknowledge these things. They can show no compensating benefits, and they haven't made a proper assessment of what the risks of these things are. But at least they're talking about them. The case of flavors. You hear a lot, about, a lot of stuff about people saying, right, Ban flavours because they might affect, uh, you know, they might cause young people to take up vaping. <laughs> this is really busting my balls. <laughs> um, okay. Right, we know, we know a lot about uh, the role of flavours in, uh, you know, for adults. Three quarters of adults, uh, when, they, when they switch from smoking, relied on some kind of flavoured product. So if you ban flavours, what happens to them? Um, and... Uh, less than a quarter, only less than a quarter are using the traditional tobacco flavors. This is from a forum, so it's a particular subset of users. But again, what happens to all the people who are using fruity flavors, the grown-ups? So the way this is normally counted, and I acknowledge Saul Schiffman, I think, is in the audience, is they did a brilliant piece of work looking at what the level of interest is in um, uh, e-cigarette flavors. And they found a really, really low level of interest in kids. And we usually use this to say... Aha, there's no problem. Uh, they're not really interested in it, not really affected by it. And by the way, just for a bit of fun, uh, the, the, the things that the kids actually like most, that wasn't statistically significant, was classic tobacco and single malt scotch. So, <laughs> so, so, much for the, uh, so much for the appeal of gummy bear. And Oddly enough, kids don't want to reinforce their childish nature when they're being sort of like skanky, adult, skanky adolescents. But there's a deeper question here. What if flavours did attract young people to vaping. Okay, that might be a good thing. That might be one of the reasons, it's not shown in this, it's not shown here, but it might be one of the reasons why vaping is displacing smoking in the US and UK uh, uh, adolescent population. So before you get too far down banning these things, think about it, this is part of the value proposition to people who are under 18, or it could be, uh, and why should harm reduction start at the age of 18? Who made that one up? Right. There you go. So another thing from, uh, you know, obviously I admire Rupert Murdoch for many things. Um, but this is, this, is, uh, this is his argument about, you know, having a pro-innovation uh, approach to uh, regulation. Um, and this, I, I'm, I'm going to skip this actually because I'm going to run out of time otherwise. But there are, I think what I want to say is this isn't an argument against regulation. This is saying you want a right amount of regulation. Some regulation, setting standards, putting things right, builds confidence in the product, protects consumers, gets rogue, rogue operators off the market, um, and uh, basically builds up the total benefit to society. But you start pushing that, you add more and more regulation, more and more costs, more and more burdens and restrictions, and that process reverses. You reach a peak and you start to go backwards. 
You're starting to then lose uh, valuable products, compromises consumer appeal, um, the uh, products become more expensive and less diverse and so on, till you get to the point where actually it's, it's starting to be negative. Um, and you're starting to actually do damage by the way you're distorting the whole market for, for these products. And that, again, is, this is the story of unintended consequences. It's something you have to get right. And you, what you're trying to do is find this a, a sweet spot. The point, the point where the regulatory uh, approach to this marketplace gives you the optimum benefits to the whole of society. And this, again, I'll go over this. The, the unintended consequences story applies across the piece. Almost everywhere where you could intervene, you can make things worse by intervening excessively and not understanding what the regulatory intervention does to the value proposition for the product. Right, They're regulating. So I'm just going to just go through some ideas and finish with some ideas on how you actually regulate these things. I'm going to use a thing that's uh, a device that's used in the marketing world called the four P's of marketing: promotion, price, place, and products. Going to slightly abuse that, but okay. Um, so let's start with price, the tax thing. Um, there's a technocratic. It's a good paper. David Sweeney's in the audience. You know, basically set up the pricing so that you create an incentive to um, switch to, uh, uh, from smoking to e-cigarettes. Sounds good in theory. Probably the first approximation for doing this is to have no tax on any e-cigarettes and then tax cigarettes in whatever way you see uh, to, be, seem to be fit. Um, however, the world is a bit more complicated than that. And this is, the, this is the, uh, a view of taxation. Uh, plucking the goose, the largest amount of feathers with the least amount of hissing. And the reason this is relevant is not because there's a great big rationale for taxing e-cigarettes. It's because they can. It's not a particularly popular cause. So their approach is to say, well, we've got to get money from somewhere. We're either going to be taxing people who are at work or taxing enterprise or taxing consumers. So we're going to eye up uh, the e-cigarette market, not in the rational way that uh, Sweener and co. said in the, pre in the New England Journal, but just because they can. Um, so, and we've seen the first signs of this. And this is quite a good statement of the challenge for taxing. This is from the European uh, Union Council findings in March. Okay, the right balance between revenue, the expense of tax administration, a really important thing, and public health objectives. Okay, so they're not, they're not saying this is a public health measure. They want to get some revenue out of it. We need to start having a debate about it. So it's like an almost a taboo subject taxation. There shouldn't be any end of story. But I tell you, if we're not ready for it, with good arguments, not just about what the level should be, but how you make an equivalence between e-cigarettes and liquids and a, an equivalent amount of cigarettes, um, what the tax base should be. Should it be milliliters of liquid, milligrams of nicotine? Uh, should it be an ad valorem uh, straight uplift on the price or whatever? What's the right tax structure for this, and, and what, where should it be collected? Is it collected in the vape shop, or is there some, can it be collected upstream? A tax on nicotine as it leaves the pharmaceutical plant, for example. These decisions will have a really large material impact on the way taxation actually affects the industry. Right, let's go on to product. Uh, here, I believe, the right approach is to have product standards, okay? Uh, a, a standard to which uh, people can build devices and essentially, if they can meet those standards and get an accreditation from someone, possibly private sector third-party accreditors, then fine, they're on the market. And that's a sensible, low-impact way of uh, dealing with the, you know, dealing with setting high standards. And I'm not going to go into this in detail, but this is the AFNOR standard. I recommend this. It's quite an interesting thing that's attempted to uh, look at different aspects of the devices. So mechanical, thermal, chemical risks, and what you say about the device. And then this is the standard for liquids. So it's things about what can be in it, is there a banned list, other things like that. And it's essentially a rule book for making these products. Now, I'm not particularly endorsing this standard, but I'm endorsing this approach as a way of doing it, setting the ground rules for participation in this marketplace. Electrical safety, take detailed notes on this. <laughs> Don't bother. They're using, quite rightly, they're using existing standards to, to try to you know, manage the uh, safety. Just in terms of the product, what's said about the product in terms of a warning, this is the EU warning. It's terrible. 
It's, you know, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't tell you anything. It's actually wrong. You know, um, and it, it, the, it doesn't give you any useful consumer information. So if you put the consumer at the heart of this, you would say something like this. You know, that is what a consumer really needs to know about, about this product. That is the sent pertinent information, the bit of stuff that you actually need to know about what's in the box. Uh, let's go on to place. Normally that means where you can buy or sell these things, but I'm doing it in terms of where you can use the, the product. This is a famous London pub um, from EastEnders. Uh, who decides what goes on in that, in that place? Okay, it's a key thing. Okay, if it's smoking, the state has decided you can't do it. You know, whether you want to, whether you want to have one room or not. Okay, the state has decided in Britain and in many other countries there's a smoke-free law. Right, these are all what I call micro-decisions about, uh, they're all reasonable things that people could do with vaping in uh, public places. You know, a, a vape night, a vape room, a place given over to vaping, a hotel that allows vaping in the bar but not in the restaurant and has it allowed in some rooms but not others. Hundreds of potential, thousands, maybe millions of micro-decisions. Who makes the decision on this? Okay, and... The answer is you could do it in, uh, by law, by, by parliament, but that's a bad idea. You should only do that if you want to override the preferences of owners and managers who should be making the decisions unless there's a case for overriding. And then you come back to this guy again. There's only a case for overriding the preferences of managers and owners in public places if there's a material harm caused by... Uh, allowing it to, to bystanders, to other people. And there isn't in this case, certainly not established, far from it. Right, the next thing is I searched the internet to find the most iconically offensive uh, uh, <laughs> e-cigarette advert that I could because I wanted to put this up, uh, and I probably ought to complete that sentence, I wanted to put this up really to illustrate a point. Put some clothes on, woman, that's better. Um, to illustrate a point, basically, People have railed against that. It's, been, it's caused outrage. It happened to have been in a, a magazine that's only supposed to be sold to over 18-year-olds. But people have railed against it. But here's the, here's the pushback on this advertising. People have said it's completely irresponsible. But what if 2,000, um, you know, 16 to 24-year-old lads saw that ad and decided to try vaping? Okay. Who, who knows what the effect of that? It could have been very beneficial. It could have been capturing them in a way they wouldn't be captured in some other way. And if you banned it, then maybe they wouldn't have tried it. So again, think unintended consequences before you pile in and start to turn all the advertising for e-cigarettes into something as boring as NRT advertising. Because there's a cost to that. You might not get those lads. Um, and we have, we, I think we have actually found a, a balance between these these things, these objectives, about not being offensive, not being irresponsible. I think it was a good piece of work, and there was a pretty broad consensus around it uh, in, in the UK, um, which were some guidelines which are roughly the same as the way we treat a alcohol advertising, more or less. You know, don't be irresponsible, don't target kids. I'm not arguing for targeting kids. You probably can't be allowed to do that for political reasons, but it doesn't matter too much if these ads do reach kids because it's going to change them from smoking to vaping. Of course, nothing as sophisticated as that, um, you know, has been permitted in the EU. And the EU is going to wipe out nearly all uh, advertising. No sense at all of the unintended consequences of that or any responsibility for them. We've got a dominant incumbent cigarette market in the, uh, in the European Union. They're going to remove the primary vehicle for communicating and brand building for the insurgent disruptive entrant product. How stupid is that? Really bad regulation. Right, uh, so just to summarise, um, my view is nothing that's been done so far is worth anything. It's all rubbish and it's all worse than doing nothing. So do nothing should always be the starting point for regulators. So far that would be the superior uh, regime compared to all other things, possibly with the exception of the advertising thing. Regulation is there to benefit consumers. It's not there to appease interest groups or please tobacco control or public health or whoever. It's there and the focus should be the needs of consumers. Um, regulators should be haunted. I use the choice haunted deliberately because it, there's dead people involved in this calculation. It's a life and death matter. It's human flesh and blood. You should be haunted by the prospect of unintended consequences. 
Um, focus on disease risk, not, you know, closing down the tobacco industry or ending nicotine addiction. That should be the focus, okay? And that means uh, being open to harm reduction. Um, the regulation should promote informed choice and we should give messages and clear information about things. Shouldn't be a barrier to innovation because innovation is the future. This is what's going to change the world by 2040 is the products that are on the market in 2040, not the products that are on the market now. Um, proportionate and justifiable standards, those, those help with informed choice because they mean you don't have to be an expert on what additives are carcinogenic and so on. So standards take some of the heavy lifting out of informed choice. And then finally, regulators, frankly, should mostly get out of the way. The e-cigarette market is fantastically successful prior to all these grand regulatory schemes like the EU, TPD, and like the uh, you know, FDA deeming regulation. It's a consumer uh, and innovator market-based uh, you know, disruptive technology. It's proceeding without any, has proceeded very well without any uh, regulatory involvement, well, much anyway. Um, you know, no public money has been spent on it. No healthcare system resources have been spent on it. It's been amazingly successful without any, you know, regulation beyond normal consumer regulation. That's the real take home here is before you intervene, just check that you're not making things worse and that do nothing wouldn't be superior to what you're about to do. Thank you. Thank you.